Hey, good afternoon, Mitch. Good everything to everyone. Hey, David, how are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm doing fine. Today, we have a sunny day again here in Madrid. I don't know. It's probably much better where you, where you are, right? <laughs> we have 30 degrees in sun here. It's actually quite yeah. warm. Um, looking outside, blue skies. It's amazing to be here. Only one more week left before I leave this place. Yeah, um, unfortunately, but I'll be back in January. Actually, I like it so much here that uh, yeah, I'll come back. I saw this last weekend in the news that people were still having fun on the beach and uh, enjoying the sun. Yeah, I actually went to the beach both days. Um, it was really nice to cool off in the water. And yeah. it's really everyone is on the beach here. Okay, well let's uh, let's do something. Uh, for fun, uh, even even though we are not in enjoying the sun outside, let's we we can also do something. Yeah, I was very close to taking this from the beach, but you know, well, sanding well, this, your ventilators is not that. This is something you could, you could actually do, and I was thinking that I don't know if you have read uh, the Java Specialist newsletter. The, mm -hmm. the that's that's a very good one, by the way. It's uh, written by Doctor. Heinz Kabut from Crete, from the island, of, from the beautiful island of Crete. And he always starts his uh, newsletter saying how nice the weather is in the island of, of Crete. So you should, be, you should start doing the same thing. We should start doing this uh, promotion of the, the place where, where you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Uh, we have more important things to do, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to start saying that uh, last last Friday uh, we ran into some kind of issues, some kind of problems, and after the session, I well, I was concerned because I got that feeling, that useful feeling that something didn't work out as we expected, and now I need to investigate why. But we found out what what the problem was uh, for. Uh, all of those of you that don't remember, we were trying to show how uh, we could use Spring Developer Tools, uh, Spring Boot Developer Tools, so so that we could actually start the Docker Compose instance and all the containers just by clicking the play button on our JetBrains uh, IDE. But then, um, well, no point or exception. Yeah. It's Not Java, it, right? Yeah. yeah. It was it was uh, something. It was complaining because uh, it seems like the the Docker container was not responding with the information that uh, Spring Developer Tools were were expecting. And I was investigating why. And let's let's share this because actually it wasn't our fault. It I was, thought it was your laptop's fault, David. No, well, it, it was get was, Docker going for weeks and suddenly it doesn't work on your machine. Come on, it's suspicious. Yeah. That's actually that was actually the problem because I updated my Docker desktop, I updated to the last version, and then uh, we find out that uh, by using uh, Docker Compose 2.23 uh, with Spring Boot, uh, Spring Developer Tools, uh, there is some kind of issue that is exactly provoking what we were uh, facing. Is uh, it's something that. The good news is that uh, it's, this is something that is already solved. The bad news is that it's solved in Spring Boot 3.1.6, which has not been released. And it's also solved in Spring Boot 3.2 release candidate one or two. I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't remember the, the exact. But today is Friday, right? They always release patch releases for spring on Friday. So let me quickly check. No, it's not there yet. No, no, no. I was, yeah. I was actually checking before. before. Oh, oh. But I mean, we are doing this. More or less monthly now or all four, yeah, it's, four it's cadence. Yeah. Probably, probably, uh, probably if uh, someone is uh, watching the, the recorded streams, probably they already have 3.1.6 uh, published. If not, what we could do, we could start by just uh, adding uh, uh, this uh, or referring, upgrading our dependency to the last uh, snapshot. And so see the bleeding edge, yeah. yeah. 
it's it's we, we we need to maybe we are going to introduce any other bugs or any other issues but well probably because of, of, of what we are doing let's let's try to uh well to to have some fun and to uh put things uh, to the to the ads so um let's start by uh adding um yeah that's that's a good reminder so let's start by by trying to upgrade our Docker Compose uh, support or our Spring Developer Tools to the latest version. What we are going to do is let's try to um, just uh, actually I had this uh, there is here somewhere over here there is uh, a hint saying hey. If you try 3.1.6 snapshot, uh, probably this is going to be solved. So that's actually what we are going to do and see if we can get rid of this problem. So let me quickly copy paste this uh, this uh, URL. And then the, the, the first thing that we need to do is we need to add, uh, because you know it's not usually intended that anyone can download any snapshot version from the from maven central so the first thing that we need to do is uh define an extra repository so that we could because if we just try to upgrade our spring boot version to 3.1.6 snapshot that's probably going to not work if we try to refresh our Maven project. Sorry. In your case, it might work because you already have it cached in your local Maven cache. Uh, probably. Probably, I, because you already tried it yeah. out. So it might work in your case. But in, in, in any case, what we should do is just add a new repository uh, so that we can specify that we are interested in getting also um, snapshots or uh, libraries from 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 other repositories let's put this repository here and then let's add a name which is going to be a spring a snapshot repo let's add an id and spring snapshots and then i don't i'm not sure if this is uh, still necessary but uh, let's configure that this snapshot one is by default false i think you need it yeah 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 just in case so if now we try to update our maven project probably we will see that now we are using the dev tools 3.1.6 snapshot so that means that right now if we try to run our conference tracker service application we should be able to see how this is it's compiling the service and let's docker see. is finally working fully on your computer i think we have to celebrate yeah <laughs> okay it's mm -hmm. Using the car compose file. Let's get rid. Probably it's downloading the some some images. It's starting the volumes. Uh, yeah, it's healthy. And now is where. Well, actually, we didn't reach this point. I think last. No, we didn't. No, it it crashed and burned before that. So actually, the the, the application is starting. Let's try to see the. The dashboard and now we can see that we have our action server uh starting right from the console and also the application well is trying to connect at some point probably because axon server is is still starting let's see yeah first time probably because i actually remove the images and and volumes so now it's started well, this is where I don't know with this. Yeah, it seems like the port map. Okay. Yeah, not... yeah. yeah. It's, it's, no, it's, because, the... it's actually because I need to. Uh, let's. This is the first time because I removed the 
the image. So we still need to let's, teach. Let's improve this because there is an environment variable um, that will allow Exxon Server to immediately uh, start with the context initialized. If you come with me to the Docker Compose. Okay. Um, so the Exonic Exxon Server standalone is true, will initialize the context immediately. Um, so you don't have to go through the UI and it should be yeah. up and running immediately. So let's stop and restart the, 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 the application with the changes and then Now it's starting a little bit uh, faster, I say. Yeah, there we go. Oops. Something happened. Yeah, so the server doesn't have his port open yet. We have to wait for a little bit. Okay, yeah. Here, here it is. Yeah. So actually, if we try to reach out to, I don't know why it's, ah, because I'm using so what we just did, people, is like Exxon Server is heavily geared towards running highly available, so with multiple nodes. And normally when you start Exxon Server, you get a kind of uh, tutorial wizard thing, like where you say how you want your cluster to look like. Um, with the Exxonic Exxon Server standalone environment variable, we tell Exxon Server, well, you're going to be alone anyway, so initialize like it. Um, this is very useful for test cases, like with test containers and stuff like that, where you... Yeah, we'll always have a single node. Yeah. Well, probably this is not useful for or not recommended for production environment, right? But for not really, no. For development environments is really useful. For production, I would use a clustered highly available set. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, so this is the first step. Uh, we have already solved the problem that we had in, in or with the, the problem that we face uh, in our last uh, in our last uh, session. I learned a nice uh, Spanish phrase, David. Buen hecho. Which one? Buen hecho. Bien hecho. Very well. Well, done. well it's, uh, um, it's uh, always a good thing to find out when you face a problem, with, to find out which was the problem. That, uh, that is always... These kind of errors can drive you crazy, turning your computer inside out. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully, for if, if some people is watching this recording afterwards or in some months, uh, probably they will they will not even face this this uh, this problem. But in any case, uh, let's hope not. Yeah. Okay. So let's move to the next thing that we could do. And what are, what can we do for today? Uh, we discussed last time that for now, if we go to the uh, to the conference list projection, uh, the f our first try was to just store all the conferences, all the data that we want to be ready for uh, for answering any kind of query that we receive. In this case, the only query that we have is the uh, the the list of all the conferences that we have in in our conference tracker. But we were keeping those list of conferences in memory, which is not. Uh, good thing to have especially if we have a long a very long list of conferences so what we could do is uh, we could uh, move uh, to uh, or we could start doing some kind of, uh, uh, of use a, a real database for storing all the yeah. query models right and i think there's actually a relevant question in the chat about this so um, first of all, Beka Chichua, I hope I got your name right. Thank you for the last, uh, for the compliment about the last couple of videos. Um, and thank you for, for asking a question. Um, so you are asking us, is it a good idea to use events directly from the event store to display history to the user on the front end? Or should I create a separate view for that as well? It really, what do you think, David? Well, the first answer that comes to my mind of course is it depends but i would say that um 
probably the events are so in the history based on the business uh, model that you have historically. Sometimes uh, we haven't discussed that yet. Maybe we could add in some uh, in some future episodes. But sometimes even the events are going to evolve. They are going to change uh, in the structure that they have. So the first events that you have to store have different kind of information on the structure that you have for the last one. So probably that's not that's not going to be the best way to show all the information for your customers. Uh, but may, there there may be some other situations in which uh, you want to directly show the actual changes. For example, if you want to do some auditing or to some auditing reports or something like that, in which you could probably use the the events from the event store directly. So it's it's probably something that depends on your use case. That's, that's I was gonna really say the same other thing. It really depends. Like in Exonic Console, our SaaS product that we developed, I was uh, involved in that as well. We actually have a history projection for the user which saves the data into the database, ready for querying with certain parameters like pagination and stuff like that. So if you would ask your event store for the history of an aggregate, that's really efficient, but you can only get the whole, um, the whole history. So it's really hard to do pagination on that, right? Because you get a stream of all the events, it's really geared towards loading an aggregate and the history for that. It's still possible. So if you're starting out, you can query the event stream and return that as a list to your front end. I've done that before as diagnostic tooling. When I was working at a previous customer, we had a tool for the business to investigate what happened to a ship's visit to the harbor. And in this tool, we visualized the timeline with the events, the data in them, and we taught the business analysts like how to use that data. And because we had meaningful names to events, and the data was in there as well, um, more and more the business analysts could like identify problems and bugs themselves or give back to the business what happened. Um, so for a history projection, it depends. For debug tooling, I really like the use of this uh, store directly. But I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and that's actually a good question because probably some some other people will be uh, having or uh, having the same the same doubts again. So if you're watching this later, feel free to comment under the video uh, your questions, and we can go into them during the next live stream. Okay, so um, then let's try to add some kind of uh, persistence. Let's try to use a, a real database server. And What's your favorite database, uh, David, after yeah. Accent Server? <laughs> for a regular database, for the needs that we have, I would say that my first try is always probably Postgres. Yeah. What's yours? Well, I don't really have a preference, uh, but I see Postgres used everywhere. Like almost every customer I have under my care uses Postgres. Although I have one that uses MySQL. Or these days, it's forked to MariaDB, right? Yeah. Um, well, if you are doing something uh, for my pet projects, I usually sometimes use MariaDB or MySQL too. But I would say that for more corporate uses, uh, I see. Yeah. I, I also see that Progress has a lot of. I things. think that MariaDB and MySQL are a little bit easier to handle if you just develop something small. Like Postgres has way more administrative capabilities. Yeah, that's I true. think, but honestly, I'm not an expert. If you want to shoot me, go into the comments. Yeah. <laughs> but for well, now, so I think we're both like uh, most comfortable with Postgres, right? Yeah. And the thing is that we now that we have our Docker environment working, uh, it could be very easy to just switch the, the, the databases later. But let's first focus on, on how we will actually prepare, upgrade our, co our code to, to support that kind of persistence. So I guess the first thing that we need to do is uh, just add some kind of support for, uh, for JPA or for uh, this kind of storage, right? Yeah. 
So my first choice always is GPA because it's quite easy. I know not everybody loves it because there are some performance and overhead implications, but like the abstractions together with spring data, um, the repositories I'm referring to, it's just so awesome to work with. You can just write the method names, queries like that. It's uh, my preferred way. Okay, so in this case, uh, I'm going to I'm going to try to do the same way that I would do this uh, if I was using a Java project. And then if I get caught in a kind of problem, uh, because we are actually coding, uh, we are using coding, you will you will help me fix that, right? Maybe. Okay, so for doing, in order to do that, I'm going to just modify the 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 POM XML of our service, which is the module that we are going to use for uh, for uh, for persisting. It's the one containing the, the query model, right? So uh, the first thing that we need to do is uh, go to the dependencies, and then I'm going to uh, add support for another dependency, which is basically the a spring boot starter data jpa yeah so that's basically what allows i don't need the version it will pick the the spring boot version that we are using on the dependency management and then um if we are going to use postgres we need to provide the the driver to connect to the postgres so let's use postgres and let's use the latest version of course oh, so that's it that's, that's what we need isn't the postgres version also governed by the bomb no no it's not okay but probably not uh, yeah. or at least i wouldn't expect that's i you never know with spring boot these guys are everywhere yeah probably so i i've upgraded my i've re refreshed my maven project and then now we shall have the Postgres here, and then the support for the Spring Boot started data JPA, right? Yeah, perfect. So, should we move along? Yeah, so I guess we need to, well, because there's now GPA in our class path, Axon Framework will automatically configure some entities, mm -hmm. for example, for the token table, and for the um, Saga table. We're not gonna touch the Saga table yet, but it's gonna make it. But the token table keeps track of where projections are. So every time you have an event handler and it does something in the database, um, it commits the token after. So the event processor, when you restart your application or another node takes its place, it knows where it has been so far. As opposed to what we have now, right? With the in-memory, we don't have a a persistent token store. So every time we start from event zero, now when we will restart, we will start from the last position that was known for the event processor. So that basically means that the Axon framework is uh, uh, using the same state persistent mechanism that we are using for our component to store the state of uh, where the client application is uh, regarding the number of messages that has been received from. Yeah from the Axon server, that's true. Sure. Okay, so uh, now that we have support, then we can start adding uh, persistent. And the first thing that we are going to need, again, I'm here, I'm doing uh, the, sa the same things that I would do on a Java project. So the first thing that we need to do is just define the entity that we are going to store on the database, right? Fair enough, yeah. So I'm going to create a new uh, Kotlin class, which in this case, I'm going to follow, if you agree with me, I'm going to follow the same approach that we have used for uh, commands. I'm going to create, a, let's say, a projection, projection DB model. And this will be a, just a file. And for this, I'm going to, well, create, I will probably use a data class uh, because this is what is uh, easier for me. And I'm going to call it the conference because the conference. 
And then I will define the values that I'm interested in storing, like the conference ID, uh, which is basically a string. Uh, the conference name, I think that we have. Uh, name. Yeah, so do you want to save conferences or conference editions? Well, this is uh, what we were storing on the projection where the conference, uh, the conference. The conference. All right. That's good. Not the decisions. And maybe we can change that later. And then we can, I don't know, we can store the URL uh, website, the website of the conference, uh, just in case. Uh, will all the conference have a, yeah, they all ha will have a website, right? I bet so. It's hard to sell tickets without. Yeah, true. So, this is it, but uh, in order to use JPA, the next thing that I will do is just, can I use a regular token, an entity, uh, a regular uh, uh, annotation uh, to create the entity and maybe to define uh, the specific name of the table uh, that I want? Yeah, that's a good start. So this is it. And then probably this is complaining because you need an identifier. Okay, so let's try to add the ID and let's try to also define yes for the sake of checking if everything works the same way. As in Java, this will be the conference ID. Actually, interesting. I haven't used data classes as entities before. I'm interested to see what happens. Okay, so <laughs> how will you do this? How or let's try to, to check if this works this way. All right, we need to save something in a repository then. Yeah. So, so we're going to create a conference repository of type cred repository with a conference type and type of ID string. And I guess we only need to find all method, right? So that's already provided by Spring. Yeah. But then we, we don't need to define any, any, this is the regular way. Uh, we, we can do something like find by, find by name and name string, but we, we don't really need that at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's, the next step is just use the conference repository. Yeah. Right? So let's move to our conference list projection. And well, for all of you that do not know how this works, is uh, basically this is defining. Uh, with this interface, Spring Boot is defining, or J Spring JPA is defining uh, the right component for us that will access the, the database. So we right. can actually use that. So the first thing that I'm going to do is, I'm going Remember to- Remember how writing Spring applications was when we didn't have Spring data? Mm -hmm. It was entity manager calls and stuff like that. This has revolutionized the way we create Java applications. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you if you're watching. Thank you, creator of data, uh, Spring Data. It's awesome. So uh, now we are going to need the, the repository. Let's define a repository as a conference repository. And then Spring will automatically inject the the instance of the repository that we have just created. So that means that now uh, the only thing that we need to do is uh, we can get rid of this and we can write our repository and then save. These are generated methods that are provided by the crude repository interface. And then we can just save a new conference 
uh, and then uh, the conference will have a conference ID equals event dot conference ID, and then a name of equal name equal uh, event. Let's read that S. Uh, event name, and then uh, website equals event dot website. So I'm going to try to. I could have used the shortcut. I was just about to say. Yeah. I think I taught you a trick. Yeah, I try to. Uh, Sometimes they are very useful, but when I'm live coding and others are following, I try to minimize the number of shortcuts that I use. Just because sometimes people as is watching, people are watching, and then suddenly a lot of things change in the screen, and they don't get a clue. So that's that's actually wow. very useful feedback that I got from from some from some attendees to one of my talks that. Sometimes we need to try to keep uh, another place for that. Well, for the query handler, uh, the only the, what we need to do now is just uh, find all the conferences. Exactly. Repository, find all. This is going to return a list, but we don't want a list of conferences. We just want their names which means that we could have just uh, simply stored the, the names, but now that we have all this information, uh, what we could actually do, or what I will do in Java is just create a stream. Yeah, that's not, that's not gonna work in Kotlin. Like it's, uh, it's returning a split iterator? No, this really? is, yeah, fine, all. Ah, oh, it's returning an iterable. All right, so with an iterable in Kotlin, I believe you can do two list. Yeah. But this is going to, and, and then, then I can. Then you can call map on it. You don't need a stream in Kotlin. Yeah. Kotlin is. You can map in a sense. And then uh... I could probably use something like uh, it dot name. Yeah, this is something that I learned recently <laughs> on 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 Colin. I'm actually quite impressed that you know this. Yeah, actually, this can we use to list, or we can also lose the to list. If you map an iterator, Kotlin automatically makes a list out of it. Apparently. So, and then the rest thing, uh, because actually we have the, the list, right? This is it. No. All right, let's run this. Uh, do we have something? Well, from, from this, I can get rid of this too, because we don't. Have we actually got a database to run against? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, we need to connect to a database. So, uh the next thing i guess is that we could uh we could add we told that we were going to use postgres right so yeah. and we are using docker compose right so we could simply uh just define here another service right we can which is postgres and in order to try to speed things a little bit, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy paste. Okay, perfect. You did that way ahead of you. I was like, we need to fast forward this one. Okay, perfect. So basically we are defining uh, all the things here. So just to walk through it for what we just copy pasted, we defined here that we have a Postgres image of late. It's, call, it's uh, calling itself Postgres. We have a username password of Postgres Postgres, which I wouldn't recommend for production, but well, we're not in production. Yeah. And then we generate the default the database name of conference tracker, and we mount the data to a Docker volume, and we expose it on port 5432, uh, the default port of 
Postgres. Okay, so uh, we we still need something because we need to configure for the application uh, the relevant information to connect to the to the database, right? And that's that something that we do that automatically with DevTools. Uh, do you think it will work right now? I thought I read about that. Okay, no, let's, I I sure. know that. Let's, let's run it, see what happens. Okay, because actually what you are saying is that uh, a Spring Boot DevTools is going to get all this information and it's going to uh, generate all the information that we have for the application properties, right? I I believe so, but just I'm it. not entirely sure. You know, it cannot hurt to try. It's just as simple as try to click this uh, play button. And let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Postgres, GDBC, Docker Compose connection details. Yeah, if you follow me, so I've opened one of the source files of uh, Spring. Which... Uh, in the top, you can click my icon, the M. Yeah. Yeah. So you will end up in a source file here. So it's actually going to get the GDPC URL from the uh, from the database in the environment. Okay. So you can see it's going to find the service host, the ports. Um, I don't think it will pick up the username or password. But yeah, let's yeah. see what it does. OK. Well, for now, I have seen this problem. It's complaining. I don't know if that's related to what we are trying. It's complaining that this is one thing that I really love about uh, Spring uh, exceptions. It's always giving you a lot of information, the precise information that you need uh, to solve the problem. In this case, is complaining that because the conference repository has not been created because uh, in order to create a JPR repository configuration, uh, it's complaining that they cannot do something uh, with Kotlin reflection, right? Yeah. So apparently, so Spring does introspection on Kotlin classes because we have uh, Kotlin classes, GPA entity. Um, but to have reflection work with Kotlin, you need an additional library. They have made that an optional dependency in Kotlin. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess we need to add that. Okay. Uh, Kotlin then, reflect. Okay. Then I will add this uh, in just in case that we are going to need that for any other projects. I'm going to add this uh, to the root POM project, right? Yeah. Sounds smart to me. Okay. Let's add this here another dependency which is called come on it froze hey come with me i can type see yeah so shall i do it then now up oh, we were uh, doing uh, we all right you go. Hey, go go ahead go ahead yeah okay thank yeah. you i finally get to write some well, i would say code but it's xml unfortunately for mm -hmm. next session, we could change the roles, and you could be the one writing. Oh, yes. All right. So it has been done. Perfect. So let's, let's try to refresh our application. Now we have the call it reflect. Let's try to uh, run the, the application again. Let's see what happens. Oops, it's one in. Now we also see that the uh, Postgres container has been started, which is a good thing. We could see. I also looked in the rest of the code. It actually will pick up the username and the password from the environment variables in the Docker Compose. OK, so. Or at least it should. Relation token entry does not exist. So this is the token table that I was talking about. And yeah. I've noticed that sometimes it doesn't really do a good entity scan. So I think you're still following me, right? Yeah. You can resolve this by putting an entity scan annotation on top of here. And we will use the uh, base package classes and we will add the token entry here. Well, 
I would say that it may also may be because uh, we don't have uh, we don't have configured the property to make uh, uh, JPA to create the database by default. Oh, they, oh yeah, we don't have the DDO auto updates. Yeah. yeah, isn't that on by default in Spring these days? Uh, I'm not sure. Let, let's see at the default property DDL. Um, DDL auto is of course update. So let's see what's the default. Let's click on it. The default is null. Yeah. All right, this is too much code to quickly read during a live stream. So. Let's just assume it didn't. Let's try again. I, I commented out the, uh, the annotation to see if it's just this. OK, so I'm going to run it again. Starting. Okay, now it's creating the. I think that it's. All right. it's you were right. So that was actually the problem. Yeah. Turns out so, you were, wisdom comes with the ages, right? Yeah, that means that we can now connect to the to the to the database. I have uh, an open, and let's try to refresh just to make sure that everything is created. And look. These are the tables that you were you were referring to, right? Association yeah. value entry, the letter entry, saga entry, a token entry. So yeah, only one of these is defined by the application, and the others by the framework for its normal functions. So for running sagas, it has the association value entry and the saga entry. So mm -hmm. one keeps the associations, the other the actual values of the saga. The dead letter entry is for dead letter queuing. But we haven't configured that, and the token entry is for the um, for the main maintenance of the tokens, and we should already have some data in there, right? Because we have an event processor. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's uh, let's try to run some queries uh, because well, actually, I removed the I removed the the volume, so we have been starting from a, from an empty. So probably we, then we will still have a token with index zero. Ah, uh, yeah. So let's select from token entry and let's see what we have here. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a null token. It's there, but it hasn't processed any event yet. Yeah. Um, which is normal. If we have a first event, this token will contain a JSON. Um, of its current state. And we also have the conference, right? And the conference table is the one that has been created for storing uh, our query model. Conference. Yeah. But I guess that zero events means zero conferences means zero rows. Yeah. yeah. So let's try to invoke the, the some, some post. And this time we have run, we have added the conference, we have uh, reply at the conference. So now, if we repeat the same query, then we have these two conferences stored by our projection, our query model. And if we go to the token entry, we should be we should see something different, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Token sixteen thousand four hundred thirty three. Yeah. So for people that are confused here, we are of course on event number two because we've had two events. If you would look into the event store, we have two events stored. What you're looking at, at now is an OID column in Postgres. So by default, Postgres to minimize the page size when doing table scans, it outlines uh, blobs into a different table, which is called toast. Uh, what was it? What did it stand for? Um, uh. I don't know. I don't remember. I knew it at some point in time, but it's called toast. So what it does, it stores it there. And the number you see there is a reference to the address and the number of bytes 
that that column now contains. And so when it's querying the table normally, um, it will just um, it will have a smaller page size, but it will actually retrieve the data from the other table. An important thing to note is that this data of this toast table is very hard to remove because in order to remove it, you need to copy the entire toast store, check which references are still there, and then recompress it, which is uh, done with a uh, large object vacuum in Postgres. Um, so normally we recommend to turn off toast and we have quite a nice blog post about that, that I will put into the, uh, description of the, um, well, in, the, in, the, in the description of the YouTube channel, we can, have, yeah, well, so that's it. We have, uh, added some real database persistence to our, uh, application, right? Yeah, we are now have persistence. So if we now restart the application, it will not start from scratch. The data will already be there. Yeah, let's... It's persistent uh, as opposed to what it was before. So, of course, we only have two events now. So keeping everything in memory is not a problem. But yeah. I have some customers with about seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 events per second. If you keep all of that in memory, you will run out of memory on the GVM pretty soon. Um, I was thinking if we could show that behavior, if we could actually check, and I think that we can, because this, uh, no, we haven't added any uh, any logs to our list projects. Mm -hmm. so, but what's good to outline here as well is that this means that we can create a second event processor that will start from the start of time and we can create a new view based on the events that are already there. And this is a very powerful mechanism. So you can warm up a new projection before letting the queries in and stuff like that. Yeah. It really makes you able to evolve your model. That's actually one of the benefits that we have from, from this, because if we add a module now, right now, another, uh, another application or another module that is going to define another query handler, that query handler will have a different processor, and that means that it will start from uh, the beginning because there is no entry on on that processor name with a well, token. It, it would also start from the end because you can configure an event processor to start at the end of the stream. So we can in Java configuration say to the event processor, your initial token is the head of the event stream instead of the tail. The head is always the latest event, and the tail is the last event. It's like a snake game, right? Every time an event is added, the snake grows, uh, but the, the tail remains at the same position. So that's how you can remember what the, the head and the tail is. Uh, I think that, that that would be a good thing that we could add to, the, to our next, uh, as our next step to, to this application, just to show how we could configure and use different event processors, right? Yeah, why not? Yeah. We still have about 10 minutes left today. But before before that, maybe what we could use is, uh, because I have some, some other idea in mind, and I wanted to very quickly. So, and I think in 10 minutes, it will be enough time. So right. the challenge is, is it? Because right now we are building a unique module or a unique application. So could we easily split this application into different modules and deploy them as different applications. Right now, if we go to the action server, to the overview, to the dashboard, we see that we have one big application connected to the to the action server, which probably is a little bit too overkill because we are just running the same application and communicating our, our modules. But let's see if we can show very quickly how no we could split. And for that's that, maybe, maybe that's something that we could, we could split this into different actual modules. But for now, uh, if you allow me, I will simply show how we could uh, do this very, very easily. And for that, I'm going to use um, the concept of uh, the profiles in Java. Again, I have lost the ability to write as some, as sometimes uh, IntelliJ code with me. No, probably it's my it's my uh, 
keyboard, my external keyboard. So oh. what I'm going to define is I'm going to define uh, or to use the profile annotation to define a REST module. That basically means that I'm defining that this component, this class, will only be used, will only be uh, uh, started when I activate a certain profile. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to define our aggregate uh, as another profile, which is going to be the command. And then I'm going to define uh, the projection as another profile, which is uh, basically the query. So we have assigned some tags or names to different components in our same application. And the benefit from this is that now I'm going to stop the application, but now I could uh, just configure different, um, different uh, running uh, applications. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to create a, config a run configuration for the REST module. And for that, I'm going to, uh, I don't want to make any typos. So I'm going to copy uh, some, uh, some, uh, something from here. It's basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to define, uh, some virtual virtual machine options and what i'm going to do is i'm going to do minus d spring dot profiles dot active rest which means this is the profile that is active and in this run configuration only those components that are uh, annotated with profile rest will be started this is optional but this just uh, a name that i'm going to assign for the application when it connects to the action server so that we can identify from action server perspective that this specific uh, application. So let's apply this and let's copy this and let's create different run configuration for the command. And this is the command module. Another thing that I need to do is just uh, define here um, a different uh, server because uh, it's not different server dot port, right? Because yeah. of the uh... because actually um, Spring Boot is going to try to 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 start an embedded uh, application server, uh, so we cannot use. Uh, the default port of 8080 I'm, go I'm going to change that and the rest okay let me change the name command and then apply and then finally i'm going to create the query which is going to be just for the commands that have been targeted with the profile query and then i'm going to change the server port to 8082. So that's it. So I think instead of the accent server component name, you could just write the spring dot application dot name, and it will listen to that. Okay, let's let's try with with one of them. It's the spring dot application dot name. Let's try yes. with. Let's see. So now if I go to the REST application and I start, well, so far I have the action server, but nobody else is connected. Let's try to start the, the REST module. So it's 
start in the containers. The first one will probably take a little bit longer because it needs to start the containers. Now we have the REST API connected. That means that we can, for example, try to send a command, but this we already saw this problem, right? This is when this is the, the error that Axon Framework returns when there's no command handler defined. And the command handler is not there because it's not on the conference tracker service lab REST profile. So for that, we need to go to the command handler and then the command handler will, if we start the command handler, we are going to start another version of the application, which will contain only the command uh, annotated profiles, the, 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 the components that have been annotated with, with the command profile. So. This has already started. Now we can see that we have two different applications connected to our awesome server. Now, if we try to run this, then the command has, has been delivered to our second application. So in fact, that means that Axon Server is connecting uh, and routing all the commands to the next one. But if we try to run a query, we are going to get the same problem because there is no application that is um, replying to queries. So let's try to move and start our third application. And now we have all the three modules connected. Now, if we run the same query, we will see the three of them. And this is funny because the event was there when we ran the last command. Uh, the command was actually processed. The command handler did publish the event to Axon Server. And then the query application, the projection, received and reacted to the uh, last uh, event when the last application started. So, yeah, it's well, really nice. So well, actually, actually managed to do it in eight minutes. Yeah, actually, that means that we are we are building a, we were building an application that was very easily uh, designed to be split into different modules. So uh, that's because we use the messaging paradigms of the queries, the commands, the events. And the beauty of this thing is, is that you can build something we refer to as a modulate. Like what we are doing right now, I would not recommend at this scale. So yeah. it's very hard in the beginning of your project to get the boundaries correct immediately. You will always have some shifting around. And as you can see, like shifting things around inside IntelliJ will be fairly easy. Shifting things around with API definitions between different microservices is not that easy. So what we often do is we develop modulifs, which are basically a fancy word for monoliths that have modules and can easily be restructured. And whenever the need arises, you can take one module out and scale it independently um, while leaving the rest intact. So it's actually quite a nice way to involve your application once there's going to be more load. I had a, a former colleague of mine, actually the CTO of, the, of a company that I was working for before, he used to say this word of a uh, it's important to have uh, a, monola, a, a modular design, but try to start with uh, just a single application, a single project. But always try to keep in mind in your design, which are the, the dotted lines that you could follow to cut your, uh, your module, or your application into, this, into different pieces. And actually, in this case, the dotted lines are provided by the paradigm of events, commands, queries, and the way Axon Server helps and Axon Framework helps us to, to deal with that. Now, this is what we call, David, location transparency. Yes, it sorry. doesn't matter where the code is run, as long as it's connected to Axon Server, it's discovered automatically. And if you send a message, a matching message, Axon Server will know where to route it for you. 
So if you compare that to example, traditionally, if you have microservices in, for example, Istio or Kubernetes, you need to know which address the, uh, in which microservice the HTTP endpoint is, what the method is, what the body is, the contract, you need to retry strategies and all that. And all that can just be resolved by simply dispatching a message on a command or a query gateway and everything will be taken care of. It's, yeah, I really love using it. Um, and uh, I think it's really powerful, location transparency. Yeah, it is, it is. And sometimes it's not easy to achieve that. But in this case, thanks to Axon Framework, uh, we, are, we are getting those, those benefits. Yeah. All right, that's yeah. it. So that means that for now is... ah. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that I think that for now, uh, for today, it's uh, it's been enough. We have reached uh, the end of our time for today. So uh, I don't know if you have a final thought or some uh, final key ta takeaways. I, I do have a final takeaway. Um, you know, we implement persistence, we show how event processes works, how you implement persistence next to event sourcing. And you know, all there's really left now for this week is to enjoy the weekend. So I hope you all enjoy the weekend, whoever is watching, or you, if you watch it later, that you are enjoying the weekend right now. Enjoy it and we will see, well, I will personally not see you again in two weeks. I'm taking a little trip into Asia um, I will be back at the start of next year, uh, but David is going to continue and we'll, we will have guests on the show. Yeah, we will try to invite someone to be with, with me on the stage. Right. Sounds good, David. Okay, have a nice weekend. Enjoy the rest of, the, of your time. Thank you. You have a nice weekend as well, David, and everyone watching. Adios. See you.